Raise your mind to genocide recognition. Thanks, <coughs> I don't normally read prepared speeches, by the way, but I'll do today. I'd like to start by introducing myself to those uh, whom I haven't had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, it's an honour to be invited with my wife, Armine, uh, to address you today. My name is Len Wicks, and I have dual nationality, Australian and New Zealand, but uh, as I'm married to an Armenian, I think I have three national nationalities. Why did I as a non-Armenian get involved? Well, I think it's important uh, for the truth to be spoken by non-Armenians and uh, to be believed by others. My wife warned me about the pitfalls uh, such as apathy by some uh, victim communities <coughs> and threats by those who want to hide the truth. She was right. Uh, I've received hate mail and worse, but I got involved regardless uh, because of the sheer injustice of what had been perpetrated. There are those who don't think that uh, genocides have anything to do with religion. And there are those that know, but want to hide this aspect uh, for fear of upsetting people and causing discontent towards Muslims. But the prevention of the worst human crimes depends upon being honest about their root causes, so it's critical to explore what role religion played or was used by leaders to support their aims. Religion clearly had a role. I know mass killing focused on Christian civilians, Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, and the forced conversion of Christians. Otherwise, it was death. I've read hundreds of survivors' statements. What shook me most beside the sheer brutality shown to Christians and the use of Christian symbols such as crucifixion was the destruction of Christian churches and places, many with worshippers still inside. It was also the consistency of the testament that spoke to me loudest. If this was all made up, then why would the survivors give the same evidence? Even after World War I, Ataturk went on to destroy more than 2,500 Christian religious sites, years after extermination of the people. Why would you do that if it wasn't to eradicate a certain faith? This wasn't just about Turkification, but Islamization. It resulted in Asia Minor's Christians declining from the vast majority at the beginning of the Turkic invasion to less than 1% after World War I. It was an Islamic crusade <coughs> that started with waves of Turkish invasions from Central Asia during the 11th century and steadily took over land inhabited by indigenous Christians. Atrocities before World War I resulted in tens of thousands of murdered Armenians during the Hamadian massacres from 1894 to 1896 and the later Ardana massacre of 1909 and indeed the earlier massacres that took place over the century since the slaughter of Arnese inhabitants in 1064. It's therefore ironical and deliberately false <coughs> propaganda to portray the First Crusade as invaders when they were invited to defend the Christian Byzantine Empire citizens and the Holy Lands, which were originally Christian from Muslim invaders. I note the same propaganda being used in New Zealand after the terrible recent atrocity there. In only a couple of years during World War I, the Christian population declined from about 20% to be almost wiped out. This did not happen to other ethnic groups. The facts are clear. An official jihad was issued against Christians by the top Turkish Islamic scholar, Sheikh al-Islam, on 14 November 2, 1914. 
Now, this was used to provoke radicals and to justify the brutal killings of non-followers of Allah, or kafirs, the Turkish derogatory term. Despite misinformation you'll hear about the Ottoman Empire being fair to its citizens, extreme racism was quite normal in the early 20th century. Armenians and other Muslims, uh, sorry, non-Muslims, were treated like second-class citizens, by law as dhimmis, despite being the original indigenous people. This should not be surprising. Long after the West abolished slavery in the 19th century, Arab slavery continued in Africa. Even today, Muslim-majority nations in North Africa have the highest level of modern-day slavery. <coughs> the first four stages <coughs> of genocide involve dehumanizing acts and desensitizing people to extreme racism, in effect preparing for genocide. If we don't consider the genocides in the context of centuries of violence and racism, then we dishonor all victims over time. After the ninth stage of genocide, which is extermination, the tenth and final stage is denial. Therefore, successive generations of Turks who have denied the truth may not have been responsible for the killing, but they're responsible for perpetuating the genocide for more than a century by their actions. There are brave Turks who recognize and condemn the genocide, such as uh, Tanner Akcham. He's just published a book that details the actual killing order telegrams issued by the Turkish Hitler Talat Pasha. We must support and honor these courageous Turks who tell the truth, despite the threat of severe penalties under Turkish Penal Code 301. Hitler considered his Holocaust uh, campaign to be the final solution after learning from the Armenian Genocide. But ultimately he was unable to complete his evil <coughs> goal. On the other hand, the events of World War I were the only successful <coughs> genocides I can find in modern history if we can callously call it that way. So on that basis, why is the Holocaust universally recognized while the genocides of Christians are hardly known? It is quite shameful that Israel, which was built on the ashes of the Holocaust, should fail to recognize another genocide, presumably because it trades with Turkey and Azerbaijan. Having noted the role Islam played in the genocides, none of us here today should harbour hate towards a community of hundreds of millions of people, the vast majority who are peace-loving and kind. We should only question the racist and hateful messages from ancient Islamic texts being used by some as a catalyst to kill Christians. Let's talk a moment about honesty. Turkey's policy for a century has been to deny the truth, mainly by spreading distortions, falsehoods, and by attacking individuals. They also spend millions of dollars to persuade politicians not to recognize the genocides. If you examine their Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, you'll note that they try to characterize the genocide as just part of war. Despite the fact that the killings of unarmed civilians took fire, place far from the battlefields, using gruesome methods like that of IS today, and three times the number of civilians were killed compared to all the Ottoman army's battle casualties. They also callously tried to diminish the loss of so many by trying to argue about the number of victims. <clears throat> As if it matters whether 1 million, 1.5 million, or more Armenians were killed. 
During the Bosnian genocide, 8,372 Muslims were killed at Srebrenica. Yet, Turkey recognises that as genocide. So does Australia and New Zealand. As chair of the UN Security Council, New Zealand even stated on 8 July 2015, the memories of all victims, and I say all victims, of genocide and mass atrocities deserve an answer. We as a council have a duty to remember the past in order that we do everything possible to avoid history repeating. True. But New Zealand hypocritically doesn't recognise what happened to Armenians, Assyrians and Greeks as genocide, unlike 29 nations like Canada. Shameful. We must re remind our so-called leaders of their righteous statements and embarrass them if necessary because one can pretend can, sorry, one cannot pretend to have high morality on a selective political basis. Genocide is a crime. It's the ultimate crime, a crime against humanity. We do not allow politicians to politicize our judicial system for the obvious reason of self-interest. So why do we allow politicians to make judgment on a crime? In 2008, the International Association of Genocide Scholars unanimously recognized the factuality of the Armenian, Assyrian, and Greek genocides. The 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the author, Raphael Lemkin, repeatedly recognized the Armenian genocide. So all politicians need to do <coughs> is to affirm the experts' views and not allow political views or political, uh, sorry, Turkish propaganda and money, for that matter, to, to distort the truth. We need to remind them of this uh, responsibility. But when it comes to courts, the main perpetrators of the genocide, the young Turks, Talat, Enver and Jamal Pasha, and their accomplices, were sentenced to death for crimes against humanity in 1919 by the Ottoman Empire's own courts. Thus, it's deeply troubling how the successor state Turkey could ignore its own judiciary's judgment. If this was just a matter of deportation, as the Turks would have us believe, then after the war, the innocent survivors of murder in the villages and death marches would be allowed to return after the judgment of the Ottoman courts, right? If it was a matter of moving civilians away from the conflict zones and simply a matter of collateral damage caused by war, as the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs would try and have us believe, then the property stolen by the state would be returned after World War I, right? One of the most bizarre arguments I came across from Turkey was this. The World War I era genocides took place before the 1948 UN Genocide Convention, so they cannot be a genocide. Well, this would mean that the World War II Holocaust is also not a genocide, which is, of course, complete nonsense. The conventions there to prevent and punish perpetrators of genocide from 1948. But this does not mean that the term genocide cannot be used to describe events before this. <coughs> Further, consider what the Turks called abandoned <coughs> property in their temporary law of expropriation and confiscation 1915. This reinforced the earlier 29 May 1915 deportation law, which required so-called deported persons to not sell assets, but instead submit a list of assets to the local authorities. Not only was this thoroughly and ruthlessly planned by the state, the very definition of a genocide, but it was a profitable venture. Five million Turkish gold pounds of Armenian looted blood money were transferred to the state treasury in Constantinople between 1915 and 1916, and then to the German Reichsbank in 1916, 
Thus, the destruction of Western Armenia helped pay for the war weapons used by the Ottoman Empire. And enriching German weapons manufacturers like the Mauser Company. The Germans also allowed some of the perpetrators like Dr. Nazem Bey and Talat Pasha to flee there after World War I with some of the blood money. There was even more immorality, and this time not just by the Ottoman Empire's allies. Instead of returning the Armenian wealth, when Great Britain and France found the Reichsbank blood money in 1918, they transferred it to the United States via J.P. Morgan Bank in Paris to New York for U.S. Treasury bonds. Thus the ethical West laundered money stolen from a murdered minority. Where are the recriminations from this hideous act of betrayal by so-called civilized nations? After the war, the Turkish government even attempted to receive payments from the very people it had killed from a U.S. insurance company. With the argument that there were no identifiable heirs to the policyholders, fortunately this evil act did not succeed. The irony of the major airbase at Inchilik in southeast Turkey being built on land partly stolen from Armenians is not enough. The United States spends many millions of dollars annually to support the strategic airbase, and Turkey then threatens to halt access to the airbase if the United States recognizes the genocides. Speaking of threats, our cowardly politicians <coughs> in Australia and New Zealand had known about the genocides for years yet are swayed by Turkish threats to ban them if they recognize the truth. Our Anzacs witnessed these atrocities and even fought side by side with Armenians during the 1918 Battle of Baku against Turks as part of the Dunces Force campaign. Anzacs died protecting Christians from Turks and Kurds, yet there is no mention of this in the Australian War Museum when I last visited. Maybe these events don't fit with the narrative of ANZAC, uh, viewed just through the military lens. Are we forbidden to mention civilian losses? More than 70 for every ANZAC soldier who fell. And the humanitarian aid then provided by brave Australian, Kiwi and American woman, because ANZAC Day is a sacred cow. What about the false propaganda we see on the Turkish monuments in Canberra and Wellington, paid for by the Turkish government? Ataturk didn't command the Ottoman army at Gallipoli. A German did. And he never uttered the conciliatory words to Anzac shown on these monuments. Let's discuss the connection between Gallipoli and what's normally considered to be the start of the Armenian Genocide on 24 April 1915. Were the actions of the Turks motivated by a fear of a Christian uprising in response to the Allied invasion? Or was it an excuse to execute the Empire's Christians under the cover of war? If we look at the evil acts against Christians over centuries, the deliberate acts of legalized theft by the Ottoman state and the planned events such as decapitation of the leadership, removal of weapons, conscription and killing of the men, kill orders, and the organized death marches and camps, we can, certainly, we can be certain that it was planned. It was an opportunity to implement the final solution and to profit from the destruction of these ancient civilizations. But after 104 years of trying to tell the world, we have to change. For some years, I've tried to get the Armenian, Assyrian, and Greek communities to get together with one voice, to demand not just recognition, but reparations, and the return of stock of stolen property. To my great surprise, all I received was either no response, or a first response with no follow-up. I noted that inside both the Armenian and Greek communities there were deep divisions and political alliances, <coughs> colors. 
It is ridiculous to me as a non-Armenian that something as important as the destruction of an entire civilization is left unrecognized because we cannot speak with one voice. More recently, I tried to get the communities to develop a single pressure group to represent all three communities. Hundreds of thousands across Australia and New Zealand. So individuals do not have to manage the Turkish response. My vision is for the youth, our beautiful youth, to design a common brand that resonated with us and represented our voice to politicians and the wider community alike. I suggested that we use the name Justice, Justice, Justice in the three languages. Atarutu, Kenutha, Dikaiosi. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. <coughs> I made no real progress despite offering to help fund the initial effort to create a common, recognizable name like this. No one argued with the need for recognition, but if we cannot come together for something as simple as forming a co cohesive group, then the ancestors of the perpetrators have won. We need to be motivated. How is it possible for an entire indigenous community's extermination to be relatively unknown to the average Australian and Kiwi when we were involved? How is it possible that we commemorate an Anzac Day with little or no recognition of the consequences of the invasion to the Ottoman Empire's Christian peoples? You'll not hear anything tomorrow. Who mentions the tens of thousands of Greek villagers killed as a result of their so-called deportation from the Gallipoli Peninsula before the invasion? How is it possible for our war museums to not mention the connection with the genocide of Christians? Or for the Turks to place monuments with falsehoods in our capitals? How is it possible for New Zealand to demand that Russia recognize Srebrenica and then turn a blind eye to the horror that its own Anzacs witnessed in World War I. We should be ashamed. It is only possible because we allow it to happen with our lack of rage. <coughs> Setting aside all our divisions and distractions in our modern world. We need to be organized with no disrespect intended it is not a matter for a particular community's group, such as the ANC, the Dashnaks, or even the churches. It is a matter of forming a common group across all three communities, so we are strong together. We must not be afraid to talk about the role religion played in the genocides. After all, the Pope has stressed that even today, Christians are under threat throughout the lands where Christianity was born. And this threat is being perpetrated wrongly or rightly in the name of Islam. The group must focus not just on recognition but reparations and restoration. We must embarrass Germany, France, the UK and the United States for their role in laundering blood money to require the return of that resource. We must demand that entities such as Mauser are recognize their role and help the affected communities even heal, even now. We must demand that our governments ensure our war museums and Turkish monuments in our nations portray the truth, not propaganda. We must also demand that Israel recognizes the genocides by understanding the Holocaust connection. I'm ashamed that the Queensland Premier doesn't have the courtesy to reply to letters about the genocides. But can she ignore us all if we demand the truth be told? We have to educate the public around the world about the connection between the long history of persecution of Christians in what is now Turkey, Gallipoli, and the genocides. Why must we demand this? I hear ordinary Australians and New Zealanders asking what the point of this, this effort is when it happened so long ago. Because Anzac history and the essence of our nationhood was based on standing up for what is right and fighting tyranny. 
because the worst consequences of Islamic radicalization still happen today. Sadly, only a few days ago in Sri Lanka, 103 Christians died in a church not far from where Amine and I were married. We need to discuss the truth today so people can come together in peace. Not least in Turkey, where some 20% of people have Armenian blood. But many cannot speak about this in the current environment of fear and racism. We need to help Turkey heal so Turks can finally lift the weight of this crime from their shoulders, just as Germans did by recognition and reparations to the Holocaust victims. Turkey must rebuild the cultural heritage of Asia Minor. We need to convince Turks that this is a positive step for their nation and their people, which will celebrate the vibrancy of the indigenous tribes they, who used to live there, rather than hide it. And this must surely be good for tourism. We need to encourage peace and trade with Armenia and to help us rebuild Armenia into a modern nation after years of illegal blockades of a landlocked nation by Turkey and Azerbaijan. Just as we're doing with our Adopt a Village program, which is endorsed by Premier Gladys Berejiklian and the Armenian Church. I have a dream that I talked about in my novel, that of a courageous Turkish leader who came to Armenia to apologize for the genocides and who offered access to Ararat as a small symbol of compensation for what happened to the Armenian people. In my vision, the Christian peoples forgave the Turks as they are bound to do if things are made right. I hope that together we can make that dream come true. Now, I know that was very long, but I'd just like to read a very short poem, if you don't mind. Thank you. I wrote this a few years ago because I became a little cross at the lack of recognition. So it comes from here. And it's called, On Anzac Day We Stand and Think. On windswept hills the Turks await, among sweet thyme and bush ablaze. From distant lands men know their fate, from ships they stare to hell amaze. They stood for right against our foes, to fight the Turks Great Britain called, an empire dying its final throes. Killing its people, the world appalled. Christian soldiers forced to fight for the Ottoman threat to rear, for the Pasha using might against Armenians full of fear. On Anzac Day, we stand and think why fight here now, this blood stained code? <coughs> Excitement gone in a blink, into horror, brave men drove. Now we read a mournful story of tragedy and tale so bold, but do we remember history or only partial truth we're told? Anzac soldiers' muddy trench cry for our fallen heaven sent. The smell of dead and dying stench weep also for the innocent. You can hide it, fog of war, preaching murder it was not. But it's a truth we can't ignore. Christian suffering never forgot. On Anzac Day we stand and think of sacrifice at Gallipoli, but we fought for right, thus the link. Blind to genocide we cannot be.